Hey guys, all right, today we are back with some Epic History TV. This time, Napoleon's invasion of Russia, 1812. Uh, yeah, um, as you guys know, we started watching the series. We were one through six in that big chonker of, an, of a video that they uploaded. And then I went out of order and <laughs> watched his Waterloo video. Uh, but recently, I've been going back in order. So now we're at Napoleon's invasion of Russia, 1812. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and see the tragedy that is the absolute um, destruction of the Grand Armée. Woo, that is... I even turned down my volume. One must never ask for more, more from fortune than she can grant. Napoleon Bonaparte. Russia, 1812. Napoleon invades his former ally with the largest army Europe has ever seen. But for the French Emperor, the decisive blow remains frustratingly beyond reach. Russia's resilience is unlike anything he's ever encountered. And as winter closes in, his army begins the most infamous retreat in history. Yeah, his invasion of Russia was just poorly planned. Just awfully planned, honestly. In 1807, following his defeat of the Russian army at Friedland, Napoleon had traveled to Tilsit to meet the Russian Emperor Alexander. During their celebrated encounter, the two emperors formed a friendship and made an Just alliance. Just two bros hanging out. But it was not to last. Over the next five years, relations between France and Russia cooled dramatically. The Russians were irritated by Napoleon's creation of a duchy of Warsaw in Poland, which they regarded as meddling in their own front yard. They feared it would lead to the return of a fully-fledged Polish state a traditional thorn in Russia's side. Then there was yeah. Napoleon's offer to marry Alexander's sister, Grand Duchess Anna Pavlovna, to cement their alliance. But the Romanovs hated the idea, and after a year of Russian prevarication, Napoleon married Marie Louise. I wonder why the Russians hated it so much. I'm going to assume it's because Napoleon himself, Napoleon, uh, Napoleon, however you want to fucking pronounce it, um, comes from not a royal house he comes from a pretty minor family from the island of, from corsica you know and he just recently gained power within the last like decade a little over a decade so yeah he's not really s so far cemented himself as like he's a dominating force right now but he hasn't really cemented himself as someone that's going to last quite yet whereas the romanovs have ruled russia for hundreds of years by this point so them denying him, it makes sense from that aspect, but I kind of want to know if that was the reason or not. I want to know the definitive reasoning. Daughter of the Austrian Emperor instead. Later that year, Napoleon broke a guarantee made at Tilsit and annexed the Duchy of Oldenburg, ruled by Alexander's sister's father-in-law. Huh. Worst of all was the fallout over the continental system. Napoleon's not very effective economic blockade against Britain, designed to cripple his most steadfast enemy. Well, it would have been effective had it not been for Portugal and Russia, I think, being the two main uh, ones that were still allowing English goods in. Alexander. Shiver my timbers. Uh, I suppose next you will be blockading the moon. Ha! Huh? Ha! Huh? Funny. To join the continental system at Tilsit but it was hugely unpopular in Russia and ruinous to her finances oh. during a period of economic crisis. Damn. When Napoleon found out that Russia was flouting the rules of the system and had resumed an illicit trade with Britain, he was furious. He was cranky. With both emperors accusing the other of bad faith, their two countries began preparing for war. At Tilsit, Russia swore an eternal alliance with France. 
Now she breaks her oaths. Does she believe us degenerate? Are we no longer the soldiers of Austerlitz? Napoleon's bullets into the Grande Armée, 22nd of June, 1812. Napoleon knew an invasion of Russia was a massive undertaking. Yeah. Especially as he still had an unfinished war in Spain that was tying down more than 200,000. Oh, they consider this the Spanish War of Independence? Huh. I mean, yeah. I would have just called it... Eh, yeah, in a war of independence makes sense. Since Napoleon kind of, you know, technically took it over. But, you know, I feel like he never truly did take it over, you know? Um, because there's always there was always... The moment he put in his uh, relative on the throne, I feel like there was always... Boom. He started fighting back or whatever. Um, so maybe more... Yeah, just... I don't know, the French invasion of Spain? I don't know. I mean, I can understand Spanish War of Independence, but... Yeah. Yeah, yeah let's go with it. I don't know why I'm questioning it. <laughs> I don't know. I just... I always thought when you hear a War of Independence, I don't really think of... this exact time period, really. Even though France had pretty much direct control over a lot of places. I'm just, uh, maybe my brain's just off for today. Probably, it's probably just off today. Troops. Nevertheless, in 1811, he began to assemble the largest army Europe had ever seen. Around 600,000 men. Holy shit! Though less than half of them were French. The rest came from allied states across Europe. There was a Polish corps from the Duchy of Warsaw, led by Prince Poniatowski. A corps from each of the German kingdoms of Saxony, Westphalia, and Bavaria, from the Kingdom of Italy, as well as Swiss, Dutch, Croat, Spanish, and Portuguese units scattered throughout the army. There were even contingents from Prussia and Austria, France's recent enemies, now uneasy allies. Nice. Some of these allied troops, such as the Poles and Germans, were as reliable as their French counterparts. Others were very inexperienced, or like the Prussians and Austrians, reluctant to be there at all. <laughs> this gigantic formation was deployed in three armies. The main force under Napoleon himself, another led by his stepson, Eugène, and a third led by his younger brother, Jérôme, King of Westphalia. Neither of these two were experienced commanders. Uh -oh. Though one would distinguish himself on campaign, the other oh. would not. Oh. <laughs> on their left flank, Marshal MacDonald led 10th Corps with a large Prussian contingent, while the right flank was guarded by General Schwarzenberg's Austrian Corps. Another 100,000 troops were in reserve, including Marshal Victor's 9th Corps. Initially, the Russians only had 220,000 men to face this juggernaut. Organized into Barclay de Tolle's 1st Army, Prince Bagration's 2nd Army, and General Tomasov's Third Army. They would be outnumbered two to one. Jeez, but yeah. in the run-up to war, Russia scored two crucial diplomatic triumphs. Sweden had been at war with Russia just three years earlier, a conflict which cost her Finland. Oh, God by damn a curious Sweden. turn of events, Sweden was now ruled by Napoleon's ex-marshal Bernadotte. But after Napoleon occupied Swedish Pomerania without warning, a furious Bernadotte promised Russia that Sweden would remain neutral. Ooh, Meanwhile, spicy. a peace treaty Drama. with the Ottoman Empire ended Russia's six-year war against its southern rival. These two agreements secured Russia's flanks from any strategic threat and freed up troops to face Napoleon's invasion. Chichikov, that's a name. I am about to embark on the greatest and most difficult enterprise I've ever attempted. But what has been begun must be carried through. Napoleon to the Prefect of Paris, Police. On the 24th of June, 1812, French troops That's began good crossing painting. the Niemen like River painting. into Russian territory. The army was so large, the crossing took five days. Napoleon's plan was to attack north of the impassable Pripet marshes and defeat Barclay's army, while Jerome pinned Bagration in place. French forces would then swing south to trap Bagration. 
Napoleon expected the campaign to be over in five weeks. But the sheep. It's gonna take you five weeks just to, like, march into Moscow. If you're moving fast. That's a lot of distance with an army that size. You ain't doing it in five weeks. <laughs> the size of the French army convinced the cautious Barclay that retreat was his only option. Prince Bagration, a much more aggressive commander by instinct, and often Barclay's fierce critic, was forced to agree. As they withdrew, they burned villages and crops, part of a scorched earth strategy to deny supplies to the enemy. In four days, Napoleon had reached Vilnius, but Barclay was gone. To the south, Jerome failed to pin down Bagration. So when Davout's first corps swung southeast to trap him, he'd already withdrawn to safety. Napoleon's younger brother was out of his depth, stung by the Emperor's criticism, humiliated when his troops were put under Marshal Davout's command, huh. he resigned his post and returned to Westphalia. Damn, that was fast. The campaign was already beginning to expose serious flaws in Napoleon's plan. Knowing his troops would struggle to live off the land in this impoverished region, he'd organized huge supply depots and transport units to feed the army. But wagons rolled slowly along Russia's bad roads, which were turned to rivers of mud by summer thunderstorms. The army had to make frequent stops to allow its supplies to catch up. Bad news for Napoleon's plan to catch the Russians, but a much needed relief for the many thousands of young conscripts in his army, not used to hard marches day after day. Many were soon dropping out with exhaustion. Others deserted. There were also huge problems of command and control over a vast multinational army that was three times yeah, that's one of the problems with these fucking armies. It's an ar it's an issue that the Austro-Hungarian Empire has in uh, World War One. Um, kind of surprising though that Austria didn't learn from uh, uh, Napoleon's mistakes from a hundred years before to realize that hey, this disconnected, uh, disorganized multicultural army doesn't fucking work because there's you don't have people that can speak all the languages Ugh. seems bigger than any napoleon had commanded before la grande armée once famed for its speed of maneuver had become a lumbering beast after a pause to rest and regroup at vilnius napoleon resumed his advance Barclay continued his retreat to Vitebsk, where he hoped Bagration's second army would be able to join him. But Davout blocked Bagration's path at Soltanovka, forcing him to make for Smolensk instead. At Vitebsk, Napoleon clashed with Barclay's rearguard, but once more the Russians escaped, after setting fire to all the stores they couldn't take with them. Yeah. Meanwhile, 300 miles away, on Napoleon's southern flank, Russian 3rd Army attacked and defeated the Saxon 7th Corps, forcing Napoleon to divert Schwarzenberg's Austrian Corps to their aid. By the end of July, Napoleon had advanced 250 miles into Russia, much further than he'd planned. And the long marches in extreme summer heat continued to take a heavy toll on his men with russia gets hot it gets extremely hot i've never heard of russia getting really that hot i mean i obviously summer can be warm but russia getting hot hot hotter than what you know the french and italians are used to kind of eh I mean, maybe? I don't someone that knows European geography and European weather better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Teach me. Without fighting a major battle, the army had already suffered 20% casualties. Oh damn. From exhaustion, 
and illness, particularly Already? typhus and dysentery. The army had entered Russia with a quarter of a million horses, but they were now dying at a rate of a thousand every day Holy from exhaustion shit. and lack of fodder. It wasn't just cavalry horses that were dying, but the very horses that were supposed to haul the army's transport wagons, making a bad situation worse. This crisis in horsepower came just as the French light cavalry, Napoleon's eyes and ears, met their match in Russia's Cossacks. Napoleon had Cossacks in his army, he would have been Emperor of China long ago. Huh. That's interesting. Cossacks. Self-reliant, proud, as a big, bold claim and by a Cossack. Horsemen didn't play by the same rules as other European cavalry. Every day they shadowed Napoleon's army, swooping in whenever they saw an easy target, but melting away into the forests if they were attacked by a stronger force. Cossacks, as well as Russian partisans, made hit-and-run attacks on French supply lines and depots forcing Napoleon to divert thousands of troops to their defence. Alongside Russian regular light cavalry, they also prevented French patrols from carrying out reconnaissance. Jeez. Which meant that Napoleon often... Not only are you ruining Napoleon's supply lines, but they're also just ruining his ability at seeing what the hell's happening around him. They're completely nullifying his ability to react. And it's just the Cossacks. It's not like it's the whole Russian army doing this together. It's just the con a contingent, or well, the group of the Russian army Cossacks that are doing this. It's not like it's a mix of Russian regulars and Cossacks. No, it's just the Cossacks. That's, that's crazy. information about roads or the enemy's whereabouts. Napoleon stayed 16 days at Vitebsk resting his troops and considering his options. Among his many mounting concerns was the security of his long, exposed flanks. But at Vitebsk, he received news that Schwarzenberg had defeated the Russians at Gorodezhna. His pronunciations are Blask, always so good. A French Bavarian force fought Wittgenstein's Russian First Corps to a standstill. Napoleon's flanks were secure for now. Although his main force had been reduced to less than half its original strength, already Napoleon Fuck. decided to push on to Smolensk and less try to force half. the Russians into a decisive battle for the city. Barclay was indeed under pressure to give battle from fellow commander Prince Bagration and Emperor Alexander in St. Petersburg. The army's morale and Russia's honor required it, they told him. Here we go, we got a battle. With the first and second Russian armies finally linking up near Smolensk, Barclay decided to attack Napoleon's army, which he believed was concentrated around Rudnya. The offensive was led by General Platov's Cossacks, who surprised a French cavalry division at Inkova. But alarmed by false reports that Eugène's IV Corps was outflanking him to the north, Barclay called off the attack. Napoleon, reassured that Barclay's offensive posed no real threat, began a grand outflanking move to the south to take Smolensk and cut off the Russian retreat. The so-called Smolensk maneuver was Napoleon at his best, using Murat's cavalry to screen his movements and keep Barclay in the dark. The Emperor Ooh. reached the Dnieper like on the evening Fancy. of the 13th of August. His engineers quickly threw up four pontoon bridges, and by dawn the next day, his army was across. Marshal Davu led a second column across the river at Orsha. But a single Russian division, the 27th, fought a heroic fighting retreat from Krasny, delaying the French advance oh. and buying time for Bagration to reinforce the Smolensk garrison. Oh, God damn it. The chance for a surprise assault on the city was lost. And as the Russian army began to pull back, 
Napoleon displayed an uncharacteristic lack of urgency, even halting the army for a parade to mark his 43rd birthday. When the main attack on Napoleon. Smolensk began two days later, Napoleon opted for a frontal assault. Why is he having such a lack of urgency here? Like, you're in the middle of a battle. I get it's your birthday and you're the emperor of France. And kind of emperor of all of mainland Europe. But still, dude. What? 150 French guns battered the city as three French corps attacked its medieval fortifications. The Russians resisted bravely. Smolensk. Smolensk. <laughs> Smolensk still had medieval like walls and fortifications by 1812. Really, that's that's weird that they never. Well, I guess Russia has pretty much predominantly been a fairly poor nation for honestly a lot of its history. So they mostly they didn't have the funds to, I guess, fix the walls or whatever and move past the medieval defenses there. And also just because of how big Russia is, you know, probably never have to worry about being on the defensive. So, you know, yeah, they get a pass. But Barclay, <laughs> not fearing encirclement, ordered another retreat. With Smolensk in flames, the Russians began to pull out. Just as the French fought their way into the city, to scenes of utter devastation. Bagration's second army withdrew first. As Barclay's army followed, its rear guard was caught by Ney's 3rd Corps at Valutino. General Junot, commanding the Westphalian 8th Corps, had orders to cut off Barclay's retreat. But having crossed the river, he did nothing, and the opportunity was lost. A furious Napoleon swore that Junot would never now win his marshal's baton. The Battle of Smolensk cost both now, sides around 10,000 casualties and destroyed one of Russia's most historic and holy cities, but settled nothing. Before a month is out, we shall be in Moscow. In six weeks, we shall have peace. Napoleon at Smolensk, huh? Has some bold claims there, After Napoleon. The chance to defeat the Russians at Smolensk, Napoleon paused once more to consider his options. His men were weary and far from home, and it was already late in the campaigning season. He considered sitting out the Russian winter at Smolensk and resuming the campaign in 1813. But now he was just 230 miles from Moscow. A century earlier, Peter the Great had moved Russia's capital to St. Petersburg, but Moscow remained its historic and spiritual heart a prize for which the Russians had to fight. Napoleon, always a gambler, decided to push on. Yeah, but if you march north to St. Petersburg, that's where the emperor is. And he is the figurehead and leader of the entire empire. So you capture him, you win the war. The Russians faced their own dilemma. Emperor Alexander had experienced a kind of religious epiphany that summer and rallied the Russian people to the country's defense, describing the war with Napoleon as a war to save Holy Mother Russia from the Antichrist. Huh. For months, the emperor had received conflicting advice to stand and fight or retreat. Now he decided change was needed. The cautious General Barclay kept his job but the Emperor summoned General Mikhail Kutuzov to take overall command of Russia's armies. Kutuzov had been beaten by Napoleon at Austerlitz seven years before, but he'd since won several victories against the Ottoman Empire and was a true Russian, loved by the troops. Although Kutuzov agreed with Barclay's strategy of delay, he saw that constant retreats were destroying the soldiers' and the nation's morale. If Moscow was given up without a battle, the fallout could be disastrous. And so, 70 miles west of the city, near the village of Borodino, the Russian army prepared to make a stand. Oh, spicy. 
Europe was about to witness the bloodiest day's fighting of the Napoleonic Wars. Ooh. Alright, next time when we watch Epic History TV, we will be watching the Battle of Borodino. Um, yeah, just, this was... <laughs> This is well, well, well made, like always. Epic History TV just don't make mistakes. They just always do a fucking amazing job with their videos. High quality, absolutely wonderfully narrated, amazingly well researched, just chef's kiss. Fantastic. Uh, I've got nothing else here to add at the end. I hope you guys enjoyed. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. Leave a suggestion down below for what you want to see me react to next, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.